to all my people, and if you're watching live, checking us out on YouTube, or listening on your favorite podcast provider, you are most definitely my people. Welcome to another episode of Botch Bots and Chair Shots. I am your host, a chef by trade and a mark by choice. I am the Will Gray, and I am hyped for my guest tonight, my people. She is an indie star making a name for herself every time she steps in the squared circle. She is the captain, Vicky Dreamboat. Vicky, thanks for coming on Shout Out Some Wrestling. How are you? Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's a it's a nice temperate evening this uh, this week. It's been crazy hot in Tennessee, like crazy yeah. super hot. What's uh What's crazy super hot for y'all? Because it's been pretty toasty in Jacksonville, but I don't think it's been as bad here as it has for you. Uh, we're averaging between that mid to high nineties this coming week. We're gonna to peak uh, to peak triple digits, so uh, it's going to be an inside in the AC kind of week for me. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's a hard pass for me. I'm a I, I didn't really like hang out in the heat much because I'm from Seattle originally. And so when we moved here, it was a big adjustment, big adjustment for sure. I love Seattle. The Pacific Northwest is beautiful. I spent some time out there and in Vancouver, it was a, a great area. Um, Very mild. <laughs> so let's do, uh, just dive right into it. Where did wrestling start for you as a fan when you were uh, growing up? Good question. I actually it didn't start when I was growing up at all. Um, I didn't start watching wrestling until about three or four years ago. Um, there's just like some guy that I was seeing at a time at the, at the time. And he was like, Oh, you know, wrestling. And I was like, no, no. And a Hulk Hogan, right. Just like everybody know the rock. So the first match I ever saw was one that he showed me, which was, um, uh, the undertaker versus mankind. Hell in a cell. It's the very first match I ever, ever saw. And from there I was like, that's a hell of a first match. Yeah. It's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Um, I have a signed t-shirt by Mick Foley up there. I look at it all the time just to be like, keep going, keep going. Uh, I'm a big Foley guy. Uh, so when you decided to start becoming a professional wrestler, how did that come about then? Yeah. So, um, I have been around wrestling for like two years, but I didn't really start. I, I wasn't formally trained until October of 2021, but I got to back up a little more to get to that first. Um, I was in this improv comedy show where I actually met my fiance, uh, called Glimmer, um, which was like a, I liked wrestling enough. Right. And it was kind of like a narrative long form, which is basically just like an improvised play. Um, based off of Glow, Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling. Uh, and I was, we were given this opportunity to go and do like one time drop in wrestling uh, beginner session. And so, like, we rolled. Um, I couldn't even bump the first time. And then I didn't think anything of it because COVID hit for like six months from there. That was like January of 2020. And then our good friend, um, Cooper Dean or Dean Cooper, uh, he is also a wrestler on the indie scene. And if you see SOS Pro Wrestling, he's there. He's awesome. But he bought a wrestling ring and he said, hey, um, Alexi, Vicky, if you guys want to come and hang out and help me put this up in my backyard, I'll train you guys for free. So kind of on and off throughout like late 2020, early 2021, I was like training, but not really and just kind of around wrestling. And then um, I had my first live match in July of 2021, actually almost a year ago. And I decided after that match, because I really didn't know what I was doing at all, even less so than I do now. Um, I decided to take a little bit more seriously. Uh, and so I went to the Nightmare Factory in October of 2021. Um, and that is when uh, that's when the real journey began, I think. So when you got to the Nightmare Factory, when you got there, what were some of the biggest differences in the way they were training and how they prepared you for entering work? Yeah, I mean, you know, you're learning um, like TV style, right? And also just the coaches there, Glacier, Cody Rhodes, QT Marshall, Luke Sampson, like you're learning from the best of the best. You're learning from people who are in the business doing it or who have been in there for the longest time. Um, learning from Glacier was just like whew, insane, right? Because in my research, I looked at he is, he, he is. And I looked at a bunch of old WCW, you know, clips. And so like to walk in and see these people who I idolized was crazy. Um, but obviously, uh, everything that they do is very crisp. Um, and so you're learning not just the fundamentals and not just how to make your basics look good, um, but to keep everything safe and to make it look better than, uh, good enough to be on TV, basically, right? Um, I'm still not there yet, but I do feel like uh, the training environment is much, much tougher for that reason in a good way, right? Like it's a challenge and it's a positive challenge, if that makes sense. So coming into your training with uh, Cody and the, the rest of the guys at the Nightmare Factory, do you feel like, getting trained for TV matches gives you an advantage when you go back to spot shows or house shows when you don't have to worry about time limits and stuff? Oh yeah. Yeah, I do. Because, you know, even though I'm more character centric and I think I always will be um, just match psychology in general and understanding kind of like what uh, is important when you lay out a match, I think is extremely helpful. Um, so there's no, there's no substitute for formal training. 
So you brought it up. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. Uh, I, I willingly call myself a mark for this kind of stuff is you in ring psychology. When you bring that up as somebody who builds themselves as a character centric wrestler, uh, what is the balance like for you between sports entertainment and pro wrestling when you're telling a story in the rink? Yeah, man, it's hard. Um, Cause there's a lot of people who will say that sports entertainment and pro wrestling are the same thing. And there's a lot of people who will say that they aren't or they shouldn't be. Um, I tend to find myself somewhere in the middle because I'm still learning. So I just, whoever my mentor is, that's the person whose opinion I'm like, all right, that's what I care the most about. Um, I would say that uh, it's a healthy balance between like working your gimmick and telling a story that makes sense and also making it look like a fight. Um, and I think that's what a lot of modern wrestling is missing in my opinion is like, it should look like an athletic competition, right? Um, I don't think that there's enough competitive, enough of a competitive aspect uh, maybe maybe particularly in like some of the smaller circuits and in women's wrestling just because it's very hard i think like women don't get to train as much because there's just i'm the only woman that trains at continental championship wrestling in jacksonville not because they won't have more but because they're just women are not as drawn to pro wrestling right um so it's harder to build a very aggressive women's division anywhere because there's just not as many of us and so all of that is to say when you're working on psychology you're like hey girl have you ever been in a real fight because listen i have you got to be protecting yourself all the time. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so I think like in terms of uh, match psychology for me, the biggest thing is that it should look like we're really trying to fight. Um, and then all the stuff that fills around, like all of the wrestling, all of the sports entertainment, right? It, there's a time and a place. Um, but that's something that they're really big on at the Nightmare Factory is like understanding time and place rather than just like, okay, that's really cool that you can do three moonsaults, standing moonsaults back to back to back to back, but like why, right? The why, that's a very important part. Um, so I ask a lot of uh, guests on my show and you get to, to give an opinion for the reason I'm gonna ask. Uh, I watch a lot of indie wrestling. Female indie wrestling right now is really hard to come by. What's it sure. like for you being on the indie circuit as a female superstar right now in 2022? Um, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, I didn't mean to make a face, it's just funny. Uh, I understand I how hard it is because I'm there. You know what I mean? I see it yeah. every week. Yeah. There's not a lot of you. So I'm curious, what's it like for you having to do it? Like the, the battle for a so, very male dominated field. It is what it is, but I have, I want to know. Right. Yeah. I I'll say two things. Um, I'll actually, I'll say a bunch of things. I'm not going to put numbers on it. Cause I'm just kind of working this out out loud as we do. I'll say that I've only been actually like on the Indies working on the Indies since May. Uh, because I was waiting and I'd done a couple of matches, but I was waiting until I was done with the Nightmare Factory training. And that took me six months because I was hurt and I was driving back and forth from Jacksonville to Atlanta. So all of that is to say, like, I'm probably not the best person to ask because I haven't even been doing it a year. Right. Um, that said, I can obviously only speak to my experience. And I will say that it's uh, most shows that I've been on, the ma my match with whoever I'm working, triple threat or a singles match is the only women's match on the card. Um, and a lot of people blame that on the promoters, and I don't think that's so. I think that there's so many promotions that are uh, all women's promotions that are like finding the good women on the indies who are experienced enough, and they're snatching them up. And so you have all these girls at Mission Pro, all these girls at WOW, who are incredible, but of course they don't have the time to come and work a smaller show in a smaller town um, because they're going where, as they should, the uh, more professional opportunities are and where the money is. Um, the only challenge for that is like, you know, you might have uh, in the women's locker room, which only has two of us in it. And so it's like, okay, well, there's not a women's locker room anymore. Like that's not fair because there's 40 guys in this one room, right? And so there's like just kind of very logistical challenges that come up with that. Um, but I've, I've met very, very few uh, male wrestlers who are anything other than like kind and generous and cautious <laughs> um, because I think they know it's like, oh man, I wonder how I'd feel if I was on an all women's show and there was one male single match, right? Um, which happens occasionally. Uh, so all of that is to say like, I've only really had positive experiences, but I've also been very, very selective about where I work, um, which is why I still only have so few live matches under my belt because I know my limits. And I also know that um, it's not worth getting hurt over at this juncture, if that makes sense. No, absolutely. Uh, you have in your short career though, you've had some, some pretty great highs. Uh, you had a chance to work AW dark and dark elevation. Uh, what was the, the mental prep like for you heading into, uh, some of these, when you work for AW, I mean, it's one of the big guys, you know, like what was yeah. it like for you to, to head into that? Oh, stressful in a good way. Um, so I was supposed to be on AW dark in December of last year. 
I don't know if you've heard the story or not. Stop me. You're bored. But I, um, I got hurt. So I started training in October. Uh, Coach Cody was like, hey, like, I think you got a, you got something. I want to give you this opportunity. Go do a dark match um, in December. I get hurt at the end of November, about two weeks before I'm supposed to make my dark debut. And I'm screwed for, you know, three, four, maybe five months. So it finally comes in May. So I think that I like, because I had so much time to mentally prepare and it felt like my whole, this is like dramatic, but it felt like my whole life had kind of been leading up to that moment. I wasn't really um, as rattled as I thought I would be. Like when I got in the ring for the match with Abaddon, which was the first match that I'd done at dark, I was eerily calm. It was the most calm I've ever been before a match. And same with my match with Robin too. Robin and I had worked together a bunch of times. Um, she's amazing. Uh, so I was just like very, very calm. And every match I've had before then and since then, I'm a nervous wreck. Absolute 100% nervous wreck. Like right before I walk through the curtain, I'm like, oh, I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can do it. And I've been a performer my whole life. So it's like, it's really, really weird that um, going out and putting on a performance that's also athletic just makes me that way. But I'm like, I'm. can I swear on here? No, No, you can swear. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah every episode racket. gets the E on purpose. I just go ahead and blanket it just to be safe. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cool. 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 Just making sure. Um, I hate to do that. And then you'd be like, this is for kids. I'm like, oh, my bad. Um, but yeah, so uh, the mental prep, like I had a long time to prepare for AEW Dark and I was around people that I knew. Um, so I can imagine in the future when I go back uh, or when I work at another place, hopefully I'll have an opportunity with WWE or with Impact someday, right? I can imagine having a little bit more nervous because I won't know people there um, and I won't have had as much time to pre prepare. But that actually mentally, I was okay. Everything else, not so much. So when you're on a show like this and you're working with Abaddon, a lot of times you'll be brought in, and I hate saying things like enhancement talent, but that, it is what it is. When you That's go right. into yeah. it, when you go into enhance somebody already on their roster, how do you go about planning the match with the veteran to help make sure they get over, but still getting enough of your move sit in so you still get over as well? Does that make sense? Like the the yeah. blend of the two. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, the simple answer is that you don't. The simple answer is that you have a coach who's a vet and you have your opponent who's a vet or who's at least more experienced and you're there to do a job. Um, and I, I think a lot of people are like, oh, the word jobber is bad. No, it's not. I just got paid to wrestle. I think that's incredible. Yeah, it's a pretty, what an incredible that's a pretty opportunity. stellar life like, when it boils yeah. down to it. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have uh, and a lot of people are like, oh, like you can tell these jobbers, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, there's something to be said for like people who have been working for 20 plus years and who aren't who don't feel like they've earned the opportunity or whatever else it is for me like i'm just freaking thrilled that i got to wrestle abaddon at all um and so in terms of planning uh, i always defer to whoever has more experience um uh luther at aw um he's been a coach at Ed, the nightmare factory kind of a guest coach he uh was there when i was when we were planning that match and so like between our coaches and between everybody else just like what does abaddon want cool i'll do that what do i get to do yes, I can physically do that, or no, I can't, let's figure out another thing. Um, and I actually got, you know, like lucky because I was, I think, more willing to work um, and because I was not like a known entity, but because I had connections there that I got to do like a little bit more than other people do. But all of that to say, like, whether it's a 30 second squash or a five minute tit for tat match, I'm I'm just, I know it's so cliche, but I'm like truly just stoked to to get to be there and do whatever whatever's needed because you don't show up to your job expecting to like become the CEO, you know? No, absolutely. Everybody, it's a really cheesy term, but they have to pay their dues. Uh, I yep. say that a lot of times because I get a lot of flack from my podcast mates and my channel because I'm the the old guys, like get off my lawn, you know, like I grew up in the 80s. Right. I remember the territory days and, you know, Ric Flair with the 10 pounds of gold. But also at the su same time, I understand wrestling has evolved now. Uh and I know it's been a very short time, but what are some of the changes you've seen from being on the indies to working with AEW to working house shows to the big AEW shows? Like, what are some of the biggest differences you say from place to place? I would say organization and professionalism are the two biggest things. Um, and that's not, I'm not talking any shit about anybody and I'm not naming any names at all. I'll just say that as you get kind of like higher up the totem pole and also any promotion that has bigger names, is more likely to be more organized because you're not going to put somebody who has a big name about them in a bad situation for the most part, right? Um, uh, but that's kind of like a, a growth thing because a lot of these promotions start out super small and then they explode and they're hiring bigger names within the next three years. And so it's just like we're all growing and learning and changing. But yeah, organization and um, professionalism are the two things. 
I can definitely understand that because the term mud show is an old coin term, but I definitely understand it when you go to some of these <laughs> indie places and you're like, holy sure. shit, this is absolutely what they mean by a mud show. Like I've been to some of those shows, so I get it. Um, being in the squared circle isn't the first time you've performed. You've uh, alluded to it previously in the conversation, but uh, you have some history doing some improv comedy. You want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, I actually, my fiance owns an improv comedy club here in Jacksonville called First Coast Comedy, and I kind of manage there, um, and I perform every weekend that I'm not wrestling. So this weekend I wrestle on, I wrestle tomorrow, but then I'm free on Saturday. So it's like one or two days, we have four shows a weekend that I'm there. Um, and that's how we met, was in back in 2020 on an improv show. Uh, I also grew up touring the United States with my mom, who was a musician. So I've been on stage pretty much my entire life. Like I'm, I'm way more comfortable in front of a crowd than I am in pretty much any other situation. I'm don't do social situations very well unless I'm performing. And I'm like, this is good. I can do this. I definitely relate to that. I'm introverted as hell outside of the <laughs> yeah. rest of my life. And then people are like, you're shy. And I'm like, oh yeah, not a fucking chance. Am I talking in front of a group of people unless I'm right. talking in front of a group of people? You know what I mean? Yep. Uh, so when you having the improv training and the comedy side of it and being able to work on the fly, do you think that helps you in the ring at all? Being able to, to be spontaneity, uh, the spontaneity of it behind it. Yes. Yes. A hundred thousand million percent. Um, because one of the things that I think a lot of wrestlers have a hard time with when they're first starting out is like cutting promos and working the crowd. And I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out the wrestling man, like the cutting promos and the working a crowd. I, I feel very comfortable with. Um, and I'm still working on it and I'll always be working on it, but it came way more naturally to me than I think it does to a lot of people who are like, I've been wrestling my whole life, but I don't talk on the mic, you know? Um, Cause that's like way more terrifying to them. And to me, I'm like, can I just talk on the mic all day? Sounds <laughs> great. <laughs> Let's do that one. Or like, can I work, can I just go and find a kid and like talk to them in the crowd and like make everybody feel bad or whatever? Um, yeah, that's definitely. Uh, and since we started, since we moved to Florida last year, and since I started doing improv more, I, I noticed uh, market difference in um, wrestling in general and like my ability to work on the fly. So when you have a fan heckling you in a comedy club and you have a fan heckling you in a wrestling crowd, do you approach it the same way? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, you know, uh, comedy club, I think we're able to be a little bit uh, more uh, direct and rude. Um, uh, with wrestling, it's hard because I'm like the biggest baby face in the history of time, right? So I can't be like, hey, fuck you, asshole. Like, that's not, I can't do it. I can't do it. Um, I can be like, oh boy, that's not very nice. Uh, but in a comedy club, like, we, there's a tier, right? So, like, in Alex, um, my fiance has been doing it for so long. Like, there's a, uh, you start small, you're like, hey, are you, you know, are you drunk? Oh, that's good because stupid doesn't wear off, right? And then you kind of like build up to that or to something uh, It's a little bit more intense, depending <laughs> on like how their behavior is. Um, so I would say like it comes from the same place, but obviously with wrestling, you have to stay in character. And if you're hosting a show, if you're hosting an improv show, it's very different. Uh, than if you're playing it and if you're performing in it, like it's the ignore it and let the host deal with it. I have to be honest, having just watched some of your film and getting ready for the interview, the the hilarity of you in character getting in the ring and as happy and cheerful as your character is to tell somebody to be like, get the fuck out of here with your bullshit. I would be like, that yeah. would be awesome. I'm not going to lie. I, I know it would, it would never happen, but I think that would be hilarious to see you tell somebody off in character. Yeah, I would love to. I want to do like Vicky Dreambook after dark where it's just like the, like the worst of the worst kind of like you go in there with the crowd trying to basically like get in your head and screw you up. And to just know that there's. Did I lose you? Get to it. That would be so much fun. Oh, did I lose you? No, I got wow. you. Uh, there you are. You're back on my end. I can hear you, but not see you yet. Holding. There you are. You're good. Hey, got me back. I don't know where it cut off. Sorry. Um, right. As much as I hate to say it, right as soon as you started talking. <laughs> oh, perfect. All um, all I was saying is like, I would love to do a show where it's like the Vicky Dreamboat After Dark thing, yeah. and be fully in character and have like know that you're gonna have a bunch of hecklers, like know that there's no kid, and just be like, oh, fuck you, you know? Yeah, that's what like, I'm talking about. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to do that. That would be uh, 
but be a good time because there's a whole side of Vicky Dreamboat that people don't see because I'm always just trying to be such a goody two shoes all the time. So as somebody who works predominantly face like that, do you f ever feel that draw f where you want the hill turn to come just so sometimes you can show that other side of the coin? I do. I do. And because I train with all men, a lot of times um, I uh, mo like most of the dudes that I train with here in Jacksonville are heels. I would say there's only like three or four like really solid faces. Um, and so a lot of times I'm like, hey, swap with me, right? Like, let's do the thing where I, the thing that I don't get to do and the thing that you don't get to do. And a lot of people are like, you're a much better heel than you are. <laughs> Thanks. Like, I don't, I don't know, man. I'm just doing what, what feels right. But I, I also think I just haven't earned it yet. Like, I need to be a little bit farther in my career before there's any justification for me to do any kind of swap, if that makes sense. For sure. All right, Vicky. Well, I close every interview with five rapid fire questions, some having to do with wrestling, some not. You ready for yours? Uh, yes. All right. What's your favorite food? Mm, um, this is so lame, but like there's this really good chocolate protein bar and I'm super into it right now. Otherwise, it's uh, pancakes. I like pancakes. Nothing wrong with that. What's your favorite movie? Forrest Gump, maybe. That's a good pick. Solid pick. Something. Something. Yeah. Do you have a favorite song? No. No. no I don't. I don't. Um, but I still listen to like a lot of the same shit that I listened to in high school. So if you're curious, if I'm unless I'm working out, then it's just like trap. Um, I'm usually listening to like Regina Spector or Fiona Apple or Ben Folds, just like the most like acoustic -y shit that you could come up with. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Who is your favorite superstar? Oh man. Um, I'll say this. I think right now, um, and actually for a long time, Becky Lynch has been, uh, somebody that I watch whose career I've watched. I've just been like, how do I become an iota as good as this woman so i'll say for right now for right now but All there's right. still it's like i feel like i'm doing everybody else dirty so sorry rapid fire no 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 you're good uh, that's kind of the the point of it is because i like hearing it because a lot of times people will say when i was a kid it was this reason or when you know i've been training and now it's this person or this person because i see a lot of how i work you know like i like it because yeah. it's, it's an ever-evolving question if you asked me 15 years ago i would have told you somebody completely different you know what i mean if you ask me in 15 minutes 90 percent, it'll be different and your final rapid fire question what is your favorite vacation spot Ooh, cabo san lucas in mexico i've only been there once and i want to go back so bad nice always a good pick vicky this is my favorite part of every episode because i don't have to say anything all i do is ask you to plug your stuff tell everybody find you what you have going on yeah thank you okay Ooh, let me see if i can do this right so on april i'm um, april oof no i already messed it up on august 27th in jacksonville florida i will be at uh, wrestle bash which is for uh, promoted by Continental Championship Wrestling. Um, so keep an eye on my social media for that. You can see me on September 24th at Pro Wrestling Action in Orlando, Florida. And September 3rd, you can see me at IWN uh, near Atlanta, Georgia, TBD. But to figure out more about all of that, follow me on Instagram at Vicky Dreamboat, Twitter at Vicky Dreamboat, and Facebook at Vicky Dreamboat. You can also go to VickyDreamboat.com to buy shirts and stuff. Now, as we close another episode of Botch Bots and Share Shots for the Captain Vicky Dreamboat, I am the Will Gray. Thanks for stopping by and listening, my people. Carry on.